So what does Witi Ihamero's book The Amazing Adventures of Raza the Rat have to do with mathematics? Well, quite a lot, actually. And to find out more, we're going to talk to statistical ecologist Rachel Huster. Welcome, Rachel. Hello, John. Now, well, before we get into Raza the Rat, um, what is statistical ecology? What's that all about? OK, so statistical ecology is about animals. Statistics is about making sense of information. So statistical ecology is about making sense of information about animals. Ah. And the sort of questions that we might want to ask about animals would be, how many are there? What are they doing and why? Where did they come from? And where are they going? So this is obviously where we get the connection with Raza. Yes. Obviously, did you, did you look into uh, rats as, as part of one of your studies? We sure did, yes. Raza uh, was born because we took a rat to a study island and let him go, and then we couldn't find him again. <laughs> and uh, we tried really hard to find him. We ran around for four weeks or so, and in the end we gave up and went home. And then came the telephone call that said, we found Raza on another island. And so Raza had just dropped his radio tag, we couldn't trace him anymore, and he'd swum right off to another island. He was an athletic swimming little rat. He sure was. In any other direction he'd gone in, he would have just been in the open ocean. He swam in the only one direction that was going to get him somewhere interesting. Clever little boy. <laughs> so why did you release a rat on an island? I thought you were supposed to do the opposite. You're supposed <laughs> to catch those things, not release them. Well, it's the kind of know your enemy sort of thing. Ah, you see? Yes. Unless you know what rats do when they get to islands, you're never going to know how to remove them from islands and keep the islands safe. Uh, in, in particular, the interesting thing about Razo was we, we wanted to know, well, what does a rat do when it gets to an island? So if we put a whole lot of monitoring devices all around the edge of the island, mm and wait for these rats that land on the shore to run straight into them. Are we actually doing the right thing there? Or is the rat so freaked out when it lands on an island it just runs straight past everything, all the protection, straight into the middle of the island, bunkers down for a couple of weeks, and then has the island to itself, lives like a king. Yes. And it turns out that's what it does. <laughs> so that's exactly what it does. That's exactly what it does. So yeah. you think the rat was freaked out when it first came, when it first arrived? Yeah, well, my PhD student, James, he's pretty freaky, so yeah. any yeah. rat that had been in James's shower for yes. a couple of weeks was probably pretty freaked out. <laughs> so he, he escaped and across to another island, and that became a quite a newsworthy story, didn't it? Yes, well, James uh, James was really good. He had a, a an eye at the what would make a good story. And so he wrote it up and the story got submitted to Nature, published in Nature, mm. uh, which is one of the world's top journals. And then it just got picked up by hundreds of news agencies all over the world. And that was how Witty got to hear about it. It was through the news. So I guess there's more than one way of interpreting sort of statistical data, isn't there? Sure, I'm yeah. Could end up with something like this. Yes, <laughs> that's right. We think this might be the first, the world's first statistics project that turned into a children's book. <laughs> Which is ironic because I think that uh, Witty uh, Maths was his worst subject at school and he was quite <laughs> scared by it. So there you go. Okay, so that's part of what you would do as a statistical ec ecologist. You'd, you'd yeah. look at projects like that. Yeah. Um, are there other, what other sort of work would you do? Well, a big part of my work is uh, in working out how many animals are actually out there. Mm. So if you try to imagine how many whales are there in the sea, well, can you just go and count them? Not really, because you're not going to see even a small fraction of what's out there. Mm. And even if you just restrict your search to, let's say, a couple of kilometres of sea, you're not going to see what's out there because the whales are going to be down below the surface a lot and so on. So what we need to do is work out methods so that uh, the biologists can see what they can see and then the st statisticians do the rest. So the statisticians sort of have to come along and fill in the gaps, I so see. to speak. So you're yeah. working in, in, in concert with the biologists and so forth. Yeah, that's right. So we, we come up with uh, study designs, if you like, that um, the biologists have to adhere to. So one very popular way is that as they steam along, their boat steams along, and they see a whale to either side of the boat, then they measure the distance that they've seen the whale to. And they have these cool um, laser range binoculars which fire a little la laser beam towards the, the whale and they can work out the distance that way. 
And then once we know the distance, we can see how those whale sightings fall off oh. as the distance increases. And then we, we can, can fill in the gap, so to speak, so we can work out uh, how many whales there were that weren't seen. And that's how we get to um, estimate how many whales there are in the ocean altogether. Mm -hmm. So when you're uh, sort of conducting an experiments, if you like, what sort of things you need to bear in mind when you're designing those things and when you're carrying them out? Are there general rules that you need to bear in mind? Sure, yeah. An experiment is a very specific sort of study where you have to be in a position to demonstrate cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be able to demonstrate cause and effect, it means that the only difference between the subjects that get what you call the treatment and everybody else is the treatment. So you've got to be very careful that, uh, let's say, if you're looking for the effect of smoking on cancer or something like that, the only difference between the people who uh, smoke and the people who don't smoke has got to be that they smoke. Mm. They, there can't be any other sneaky differences. So what might happen is, for example, you might get people who smoke because they're stressed out. And if they're stressed out, then that might be the cause of the cancer. It might not be the smoking at all. Mm -hmm. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to get a whole lot of people who are completely alike. Uh, there's, no, there's no obvious difference between them. And you'd have to say, right, okay, you half, half of them, you, you people are going to smoke for 20 years, and the rest of you are not going to smoke for 20 years, and then we're going to see who gets cancer. But you can't do that. No, <laughs> so there are some things right? you, can't, you can't do an experiment for because it's just unethical. You yes. can't tell people you're going to smoke for 20 years and then we'll look to see if you get cancer. It's just not fair. It's just not fair. <laughs> Is that where this, this p-value comes in? I mean, it's obviously you know, nothing to do with flu medications, but what... Is that the, is it, does p-value come into this? P-values come into just about everywhere, yes. Yep. A p-value is just an assessment of evidence. So it's a measure of your evidence. Right. So whether you're doing an experiment and you've, you've actually made sure that there's no difference between your two subjects, apart from maybe that they smoke or whatever, hmm. uh, or whether you're doing an, any other sort of observational study, you may have a, a p-value at the end of it. And so the p-value is a measure of how suspicious you should be. Uh -huh. So you start off by saying, okay, there's no problem with smoking. Smoking doesn't do anything to us. Smoking doesn't cause cancer. Nothing going on, don't worry, all's, all's just fine. And then you get your p-value. And if your p-value is small, that means you should be suspicious. It means, uh, oh, maybe there is something going on after all. Ah. So the smaller it is, the more suspicious you should be. Smaller the p-value? Yep. Oh. That's right. Because a p-value is a measure of commonness. Oh, okay. And if it's not common, then you should be suspicious. Then, then you've got variables. Sort yeah. Of thing is the invert, inverted uh, conclusion, isn't it? That's right. So what, what do you get out of, of, of doing of projects like the rat release on, on islands. I mean, is it oh, it's, it's great. Yeah, I can look out of my window at the islands in the Gulf and I can know that I made a difference. Yeah. Just a small difference, but there's a lot of people out here making a difference. And um, so it, it, the, the work that I do is um, it's a mixture of quite practical stuff, like the rat mm. work, and quite theoretical stuff. And the um, things I was talking about, about how, how many whales are there in the sea, that's more theoretical. And in the theoretical work, it means that I can be making an impact on thousands of studies in the long run. But I'm not going to see them happen. I'm not going to be there on the boat counting the whales. Yes. But I, I've got that knowledge inside myself that I've made a difference. Whereas with the rat work, the practical stuff, it really is right on my doorstep. I look out of my window and there's an island that's covered in native bush full of native birds. That's wonderful. So I can see the difference that I'm making. It's a good mix. That's very cool. And do you have a, uh, any new projects coming up that you're excited about? Oh, yeah, there are well, there's lots of things going on. Um, right at the moment, uh, we're still working on rats. We're working on um, pigeons navigating. Yes. Uh, so do they, how do, the, how do pigeons how do get they home? Do that? How do they do it? Well, it turns out they do it by lots of ways. And that's why it's quite difficult to tease out the importance of different factors. So we think that they, uh, they're lazy. So if you've got a road, a big road, a <laughs> motorway, heading right to where they want to go, they'll just follow the road. 
But if there's no road, what do they do? Well, there's a few rules. They don't like flying over forest, we think, because yes. uh, there are predators, yes. uh, hawks and stuff. Yep. Uh, they Surely they're using the magnetic field, but that's hard. You know, if you've got an easier cue, they'll go for it. They'll go for the easier cue. Wow, and they'll use modern things like a, a big road, just whatever visual. Oh, for sure, thing they yes, can. roads, rivers, um, but roads are better because they're more linear. Rivers yes. sort of meander around. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. you think? Well, we, so before we came along, they what did they do? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> well, before we came along, people didn't go along releasing pigeons no, and, <laughs> and giving them messages and. <laughs> So we've evolved yeah. together on that one. Yeah, if we have actually, because they have been bred for their navigational abilities. Yes. So there has been selective, selective breeding going on. Yes, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, now I also noticed that uh, you got an excellence award in teaching, just looked out in the corridor there, and part of what you, your award was about was actually making something which is, I guess, a bit potentially dry, like crunching numbers, into something which is more fun. Well, you know, it was never dry to start with. <laughs> no, well, this is it. Just need to be unlocked. Exactly. So, 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 how do you do that? What sort of things do you do to try and bring it alive? Okay. Well, the thing is that this statistics is just fascinating, and like you say, it just needs to be unlocked. If you just stick to the the bones of the subject, then it might not seem that interesting. Mm. But the fact is that statistics is about making sense of our world, and there's so many fascinating things in our world that we'd like to make sense of that it doesn't take too much to unlock it. So um, there's, there's so much weird or funny science out there, and it all relies on statistics like any yes. other science. And so I like to pick the funny things for the examples that I use in class. Uh, so like, does heavy metal music make your plants grow? Turns out it does. <laughs> well, yeah. It does. There's evidence. Well, a there was slight an sort of tor torture, or is it actually? <laughs> I thought it was Beethoven and Mozart you're supposed to play them. Oh, no, that's only when the experimenters can't stand the heavy metal. Oh, I see. <laughs> they go for the Beethoven and Mozart instead. That's when the human element comes in. Exactly, the, the yes, yes experimenter effects. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So that actually works, that heavy metal mu music makes your plants grow. Well, you know, the truth is, it was done by Mythbusters, oh, uh, yes. the TV program. Mm. They worked out that heavy metal music was the best of all of their effects, but they weren't doing a really good experiment. Yeah. They were Funny, that. They were falling <laughs> over in all sorts of, of bad ways. Uh, so I was trying to dig up the figures to see if I could find some, some proper experiment that had mm. been done. And I did manage to find one proper experiment that had been done, but there it specifically said that the uh, experimenters couldn't bear loud music. <laughs> so they used uh, quiet, fluting music instead. Now, yes. I'm sure their plants would have grown better if it had exactly. been metallic. Exactly, something really yeah, yeah. hard on. But they did find an effect. They found that the music did make the seeds sprout more quickly and better than no music. Well, you can see that even the, maybe the vibrations coming off some of the low yeah. end of that heavy metal music that yeah. rattled them into, yeah. <laughs> into life. Yeah, well, that's a bit of a puzzle because I thought it was the vibrations that was the thing, but they, they reckoned that they managed to get a vibration th vibration free environment. But I don't know, I'm a bit yeah, suspicious, yeah, about, a bit that. suspicious about that. Yeah, in myself. But I guess, yeah. as you say, it's all about making the connections, isn't it, between the raw data and what you're. Yes. And what you're interested in. Yes, and that's, that's right. Kind of the key. That's right. I mean, the statisticians, what we do is we get our p value and we say, look, there's evidence that there's something going on, but we can't actually say what it is that's going on. We've got to rely on the experimenters to make sure that the only possible thing that could be going on is that effect music mm, mm, exactly. making the plants grow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they had these um, plants cocooned in sandproof containers and the one without music was supposed to have no access to sand whatsoever, and the one with music was supposed to be music constant. That's, that's the way they did it. Well, that, that's very interesting. I have to get my Metallica out and give it a go <laughs> when I get home. But thanks very much for talking to us today, Rachel. It's You're been welcome. very interesting. Thanks.